Amen and Amen and Amen. It says, within the veil, I want to come. That's the place to be. Beyond the veil of the flesh, the veil of sense knowledge, the veil of fleshly life, that we will come into that place where God is. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In every struggle of life, in every battle that you face, there is just one place to overcome. The realm of the spirit. That's the place to be. That's one place to live in, to dwell in, to act from. Jesus says that no man has, has ascended to heaven except the Son of Man who is in heaven. At the time he was speaking, he lived and dwelt in heaven, in the heavenly life. And he is also teaching us by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon us to move in the Spirit, to dwell there, to live there, to speak from there, to pray from there, to act from there, to move from there. The moment we begin to move in that place of the Spirit, there is no defeat. That's the place of absolute, total victory. In every matter of life, in things spiritual or in things natural, that's the place of victory. And it is taking man quite a lot of trouble to learn from that transition from the earthly life to the heavenly. He says, we have borne the image of the earth, but we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. By our natural birth, we have the imprint in our DNA of the earth. And so we naturally operate in the earth realm. It's natural. We've borne the image of the earth, the living soul. But we shall also bear, and we already have now, planted in our spiritual DNA, the image of the heavenly. For in Adam all died. In Christ shall all be made alive. Praise the name of the Lord. So in him we live and move and have our being. So if that scripture can be operationalized, then we will come into the place of absolute victory. In him, as Paul says, we move. In him, we live and move and have our being. So think about your whole life. How you relate to life. Can we truly say, in him, I live. In him, I move to the white market. In him, I have my being. If we can truly say that, then we are free. Praise the name of the Lord. And um, I call this the place called there. The great there. Oh, hallelujah. The great there. There speaks of a location. A location in the realm of the spirit. Now, the psalmist, praise the Lord. Let's try to leave the great there. Here, T H E R E, there. The great there. Hallelujah. 
The psalmist says in Psalm 72, verse 16, There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains and the fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth his name shall endure forever his name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayer of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. Glory, hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the prayer of David, the great king. That the earth will be full of his glory. When a handful of corn make it to the top of the mountains. Blessed be God forever. It doesn't seem that's the place to find corn. But here there shall be, here shall be a handful of corn in the earth. Upon the top of the mountains. That speaks of the overcomer class. The first fruit company. Attaining the first fruit resurrection. Christ the first fruits. Two order of resurrection. Christ the first fruits. Afterwards. They that are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he puts down all rule and all authority and all power, all dominion, for he must reign till every enemy is brought under footstool. But there is a handful of corn, a company of people here called corn. Jesus speaking of himself referred to himself as corn. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. There was an only Jesus, the only begotten of the Father, who came to the earth, took on humanity, and fell to the ground to die. But when he dies, it will bring forth much fruit. We are told in Hebrew, he died to bring forth many sons unto glory. These sons coming to glory are the handful of corn upon the top of the mountains. Remember, Jesus is a seed corn. Just a grain. And he gave up his life in debt to bring forth many membered body. Here referred to as the handful of corn. No longer a seed but many sons unto glory. These sons and daughters of the Lord at this hour will not be trapped in the earth. Although they are in the earth, they do not war after the manner of the earth. The weapons of their warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. They are the ones that dwell in Mount Zion, the holy mountain. And so we are speaking about a place called there. A place to be in God where all the battles are fought. 
Remember, there was this war between Israel and Amalekites. Moses went up to the mountain. And there with him were Aaron and Hur. And they held up Moses' hand upon the mountain. And as long as the hand of Moses remained lifted up, the Bible says that Joshua in the plains discomfited the Amalekites with a sword. And when the hand of Moses were weakened, the battle began to be against Israel. But whenever his hands remained hard, the Amalekites were discomfited. So, God desires a people at this time to be located in his presence. The mountain is no other but Zion, the holy hill. The presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. When we sang from this song of Moses and the Lamb, according to the book of Revelation chapter 15, there was something very interesting we need to bring out from that song. Song of Moses, song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Which is actually called King of the nations. The word saints there speaks of nations. Is a king of saints. And he demonstrates his kingship over nations when it was clearly stated that all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. All nations. It's not a figment of the human imagination. It's a prophetic reality. And we who are people of prophecy must look for, long for, hasten for that day when all nations will come and worship before our God. The whole of India, the whole of China, the whole of Asia, all of Africa, all of Europe, all of Netherlands, all of the Nordic countries, all of North America, Iceland, Arctic, Antarctic, all nations, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, says the book of Psalms. For the Lord is, he says, for the kingdoms belong to our God and he is the governor among nations. But that's not what we see today. We see nations in rebellion. Nations in idolatry. Nations in wickedness. Nations at war. And it looked very distant in the imagination and the minds of the Lord's people. But may you be excited in that which God is doing. He says, I create new heaven and new earth. You look at the present heaven and the present earth, wickedness. He says, behold, I create new heavens and new earth. And it's like, is it possible? He said, rejoice in what I do. Isaiah says so, Isaiah chapter 65. I create Jerusalem a rejoicing. I make her people a joy. There shall be new heaven and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. We are speaking about a new Nigeria. Great, there shall be a new Nigeria. There shall be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Righteousness. For this vision not to become an illusion to us 
or be like a mirage where we ever learn but never come to the reality where God will begin to look, relocate ourselves. Praise the name of the Lord. Because when you are relocated, faith becomes a natural operation. But when you are staying in the earth realm, doubt, fear, uncertainty. When the prophet Elijah said that this time, this is the way, this is how much corn will be sold in Israel. So cheap. And somebody says that even if the Lord should bring rain today, that prophecy cannot take place. He said, because you dwell so much in the lowland, you will see it, but you will never partake of it. Now, the Lord wants us to begin to walk by faith. And to walk by faith, you must relocate to the realm of the spirit. Where fear and doubt begin to melt away. So that the realities of what God is saying become so real to you. So that when you read your Bible, your Bible will no longer be letter that kills. When you read the Bible, you no longer will be reading black and white. He said, the words that I speak unto you are spirit and life. The letter kill it. The spirit give it life. The letter creates doubt. But the spirit give it life. So when you read spirit, you are feeding your spirit man with the truths of God. Hallelujah. May the Lord bring you to that place of real faith where you are incapable of doubting God anymore. Praise the name of the Lord. Where everything he says is real. Where you are excited at John 3, 16. Everything God says is power. Every word of God has life. The quickening power of the word of God. Becomes clear when we dwell in that place. Now, what I want to take out of Revelation 15 is the reference here to the great and marvelous works and the just and true ways. The works of God. The ways of God. Two things. The Bible says that unto Moses, the Lord showed his ways. To the Israelites, he showed his works. To the people of Israel, he showed his works. To company, the order of Moses, the order of the children of Israel, What's the difference? There was one who became a handful of corn upon the mountain. And the other remained in the low land, the plains. Moses needed to take the people up to God. And it was so tumultuous, so terrific. And the people said, look, you go up. You go up to God. Let God speak to you. We are content to remain in the plain. Whatever God says, we agree. It is so. So there in the mountain, Moses could get into contact with the ways of God. But on the plain, the mighty acts, the works. In the same way today, there are a company of God's children. They are content with the works of God. So, miracle workers go up to the mountain. 
They are in the valley, gyrating, clapping, shouting at the miracles. Amen, amen, the works of God. But how long will you remain an appreciator of the works of God? Never knowing the way of God. Even though we are thankful for the works of God, that's not my Lord. There shall be a handful of corn upon the mountains where the ways of God are clear as sea. Just and true are your ways. Great and marvelous are your works. The works are the mighty acts. The acts of divine interventions that we see in the earth today. Many are waiting for God's divine intervention for Nigeria. But how many are the means by which that intervention will take place? These are those that will know the way of the Lord. And the others will be content to see the works of God. Oh, there is a new Nigeria. Praise the Lord, there is a new Nigeria. That's true. There shall be a new Nigeria who will be content to celebrate and thank God for the works of the Lord. But beyond the works of God, there is the way of the Lord. The prophet Isaiah said, there shall be a highway. It's called the way of holiness. That the unclean do not pass by that way. No ravenous beast. No man with an untamed nature. No one with beastly tendencies will get there. Only, only the redeemed will walk upon that highway. Even if fools get into that way, they will not err. A way wherein full step into. And they make no mistake. Hallelujah. What a way. The way of Jehovah. The body of heaven. In clearness. God can reveal to you his ways. That's the point I'm making. I want you to. Beyond the acts of the Lord. Beyond the works of the Lord. Which we give thanks. But you must begin to desire the way. No problem. If you do not. Well, a company of people. According to Psalm 72. There shall be. Is prophecy. A handful of corn. In the earth. Up on the top of the mountains. They're not going to stop halfway in the middle. That's a challenge. For the ten virgins took their lambs to meet the bridegroom. And it was actually a mountainous journey. Of the virgins who took their lamb, the born again experience, to meet the heavenly bridegroom. But of course there was midnight and everybody slept. They got wearied of the journey. All, all the virgins slept. But at midnight, a voice went forth. You know, there's this company of people who are beyond the ten virgins. They are those that give no rest to the Lord. They give no slumber to their eyes. They are ever awake. That's the company that announced, Behold the bridegroom. Say, ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. Give him no rest until he establishes and until he makes Jerusalem a praise on the earth. A people awake in the spirit. Anyway, at the voice of this company of people, the Bible says, all the virgins arose and began to trim their lamps. But five made it to the top. Praise the name of the Lord. The other five went to the outer darkness. 
Because they had no oil in their vessels with their lands. They did not have the extra oil of life. That means they, you know, there was a challenge in the yieldedness of the Holy Spirit. So it's about yielding. You see, in terms of spirit outpouring, we have an ever positive God. It's called the positiveness of the divine spirit. Every good and perfect gift cometh from above, from the Father of light, in whom is no variableness, neither is there any shadow of turning. That's our great God. A God of unparalleled goodness. A God who gives rain to the land of the just and the unjust. Even the most wicked terrorists, they are rain, you know, rain force on his land. The Lord does not discriminate. He is the God of unparalleled goodness. Every good and perfect gift coming from above, from the Father of light, in whom is no variableness. But how, how is it that some do not receive the oil of the Lord? Yieldedness. Openness to the what the Lord is doing. So this handful of corn in the earth upon the mountains are those who go all the way with the Lord. And they of the city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. The name of the Lord shall endure forever. His name shall be called shall be continued as long as the sun and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. These are those that will command obedience of nations. Nations shall obey you. How do you know it? It's the promise to the overcomers. In the book of Revelation, God made a promise to the church in Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2. In verse 26 he said, And he that overcometh, that is he who presses to the end, he who presses to whatever God is saying to him or her, And keep it my works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. Praise the name of the Lord. Power over nations. Try it to see whether your entire village can follow you. At least I've tried it. I've preached. The day I recorded the, the entire assembly, of, uh, assembly hall of the secondary school where I taught, the, ninth, the entire assembly hall, I was so shocked. I preached the message in those days. I had a body. I set up my system, set up everything. Invited the whole school. And I was surprised. They came. The whole hall was filled. And when I made an altar call after the preaching, everybody, the whole hall, I said, no, 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 no. Because, you know, my idea was that some people used to come. I said, no, it's too much. Everybody should see that. Just those who want to be born again. The whole hall is too much. I said, ah. It, including the two coppers who were teaching in that school. Everybody is too much. That was to us, was landslide. But we couldn't get the whole village. Till today. What I'm talking about, I'm talking about power over nations. The glory is a promise. And it shall come to pass. Praise the name of the Lord. Somebody said to the Lord, give me Scotland or I die. John Knox, is there in history? Many people have prayed revival for nations. Just as the burden for new Nigeria. It didn't start today. It didn't start because of Buari. It's been there. 
Many people have prayed and have gotten tired. Some of them were in the 70s. I mean, in the universities in the 70s, when they began to pray for a new Nigeria. Some of them are 70 years plus. Some of them have hit 80. And are still expecting a new Nigeria. Glory, hallelujah. They are the labors of the past and the present. But God will give power over nations. Praise the name of the Lord. It is this power over nations. Power to change situations and circumstances that we are talking about. And the Lord will begin to ask us to shift our location. From being in the most familiar terrain of earth life. Walking according to our sense knowledge. And making our prayer from our head. And that's a very tortuous part. It's a part of unbelief. And that, in that place you get tired. You get weary. I have met some parents say, look, we've been praying for Nigeria. And we're just simply tired. It's not, in, it's not changing anymore. Some who even prayed for new Nigeria have backslid and have joined the looters of the Nigerian economy. They say, boy, if you cannot, if, if, if you cannot beat them, <laughs> you join them. But there is a place where the vision of the Lord becomes ever fresh, ever alive. And that's the difference between Caleb and Joshua and the rest of Israel. Forty years ago, the Lord spoke about my inheritance. Forty-five years after, Caleb said to Joshua, give me this mountain. A man at 85, ready to move. He says, look, nothing has changed with me. The way I was 45 years ago, that's the way I am now. That's faith. Amen? That's sustaining faith. Blessed be God forever. He took the mountain at 85. Glory, hallelujah. There is an inheritance, the Lord will cause you to take it. The heights of Zion. The place of God's glory. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 33. As we begin to explore this wonderful theme, the great there. Just follow carefully and trust the Lord to make you catch the import of what the message is about. Not so much about the grammar. Just the import. The real idea behind what we are saying. Deuteronomy chapter 33. I think we, I imagine I, I, I could be dealing with Exodus. Okay, Exodus, sorry, not Deuteronomy. Exodus chapter 33. Verse 12 says, And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring this people.
bring this, bring up this people. And thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me, yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. And thou hast also found grace in my sight. Well, we know the Lord knows us by name. He's called us. Moses says, since you know me by name, I'm not just a dot, a drop in the bucket. There's something personal about me. I have known you in the new birth. Since you know me by name. Verse 13. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way. Remember, to Moses, he showed his ways. To the Israelites, he showed his acts. Moses knew the way. He asked for the way. Show me now thy way that I may know thee. And Paul made that same prayer that I may know him. The way of the Lord. Like I said, two groups of people. Some just content to see the acts. Oh, praise the Lord. God has done this and that and that. But somebody wanted to know the methodology, the way. That I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight. And consider that this nation is thy people. Because of this nation, I want to know you. Because of the world out there, Waiting to see the manifestation of the sons of God. I want to know you. Because of the suffering humanity. Because of many despondent persons in the church. Because of the need all around me. Because of the poverty. Because of the sicknesses. Because of the darkness in our world. Because of the, the, the terrorism. Because of the evil. Just as it was in the days of Deborah. Everywhere was under siege. The villages were empty. People could not travel anymore. He says the highways were unoccupied. There were few travelers. Until I, Deborah, arose. I, Deborah, arose a judge in Israel. Can the situation around you provoke you to say, Lord, I will no longer dwell in Judea. I must get to the mountain top. That's the bottom of this hour. There are two things that will happen in the mountain top. Absolute security and protection. But much more power over nations to change situations and circumstances for Nigeria. Praise the name of the Lord. These are the two things that will happen. So in this case, because of Israel, because of these people, Moses says that I may know you. And he said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. God answered Moses. And he said unto him, Moses replied, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. What's the point of church life without the presence of God? 